guys, you know what time it is. It's Percy Jackson time. Let's go. We got Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief back out today. I did record the other video yesterday, but I didn't really post it on private. So it is now on public and it's getting posted currently. But when you guys see this video, it will be posted. So if you haven't seen the first Percy Jackson video, go and watch that one now. Because that will explain everything about the Percy Jackson series and what is happening on the channel. Just a little recap though of yesterday and what I said and what happened. But if you're thinking, what's the point in going back and watching that one? Because we read the first chapter in that one. We also unboxed the book collection. We got books one to five. But I'm going to explain a minor bit of what I explained yesterday. Obviously, like I've already said, we have books one to five, all the Percy Jackson books. We've read the first chapter of the first book. We're going to be reading the second chapter at the minimum today. But I also do have homework, maths homework that uh, approximately takes an hour and a half. Oh my god, an hour and a half. Oh. Wow, it's supposed to take half an hour, but... It's not going to take me half an hour, it's going to take me at least an hour and a half. But anyways, a quick recap of yesterday. We are reading the whole entire Percy Jackson series of books. If you've seen the film, cool. I haven't, so I'm planning to see the film after we've read all the books. Apparently it's a good film. I don't know. Might, might watch it, you know, live, I don't know, on like Twitch or something. But you know. Let's get straight into reading because I'm super hyped uh, yeah, today. And yesterday's intro was about seven minutes long. I don't want to keep you guys waiting as long as time. If you have the book, follow along. We're starting at chapter two. If you need to go remind yourself of what happened in the last chapter, go to the previous video. And here it is. With a massive bookmark. Let's get in to chapter two. It's called Three Old Ladies Knits the Socks of Death. I was used to the occasional weird experience, but usually they they were over quickly. This 24-7 whole occasion was more than I could handle. For the rest of the school year, the entire campus seemed to be playing some kind of trick on me. The students acted as if they were completely and totally convinced that Miss Kerr, a perky blonde woman whom I've never seen in my life until she got on our bus at the end of the field trip, had been a pr our pre-algebra teacher since Christmas. Every so often I would spring Miss Dodd's reference on someone just to see if I could trip them up, but they would stare at me like I was a psycho. I got I got so I almost believed them. Miss Dodds had never existed, almost. But Grover couldn't fool me. When I mentioned the name Miss Dodds to him, he would hesitate and claim she didn't exist. I knew he was lying. Something was going on. Something bad happened at the museum. I didn't have much time to think about it during the days, but at night, visions of Miss Dodds with talons and leathery wings would wake me up in a cold sweat. The freak weather continued, which didn't help my mood. One night, a thunderstorm blew out the windows in my dorm. A few days later, the biggest tornado ever spotted in the Hudson Valley touched down only 50 miles from Yance Academy. One of the current events was we studied in social studies class was the unusual number of small planes that had gone down in sudden squalls at the Atlantic that year. I started feeling cranky and irritable most of the time. My grades slipped from D's to F's. I got into more fights with Nancy Blomfit and her friends. I sent out, I sent out, I'm sent out into the hallway in most, in almost every class. Finally, when our English teacher, Mr. Nickel, asked me for the millionth time today why I was too lazy to study for spelling tests, I snapped. I called him an old sot. I wasn't even sure what it meant, but it sounded good. The headmaster sent my mum a letter the, the following week making it official. I would not be invited back next year to the Ants Academy. Fine, I told myself. Just fine. I was homesick. I wanted to be with my mum in our little apartment on the Upper East Side even if I had to go to public school and put up with my obnoxious stepfather and his stupid Quaker parties. And yet there was, th and yet there were things I'd miss at Yancey. The view of the woods out my dorm window, the Hudson River in the distance, the smell of pine trees. I'd miss Grover, 
who'd been a good friend, even if he was a little strange. I worried how he'd survive next year without me. I'd miss Latin class too, Mr. Bruner's crazy tournament days and his faith that I could do well. Uh, as exam week got closer, Latin was the only test I studied for. I'd forgotten what Mr. Bruner had told me about this subject being a life and death for me. It, well, I, I wasn't sure why, but I started to believe him. The evening before my final, I got so frustrated. I threw the Cambridge Guide to Greek mythology across my room, dorm room. Words had started swimming off the page, circling my head, the letters doing 180s as if they were riding skateboards. There was no way I was going to remember the difference between Chiron and Charon, or Pelagidice and Pelagides. I'm conjuring those Latin verbs. Forget it. I placed placed the room feeling ant like ants were crawling around inside my shirt. I remembered Mr. Bruner's serious expression, his, his thousand-year-old eyes. I would accept only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I took a deep breath. I picked up the mythology book. I'd never asked the teacher for help before. Maybe if I talked to Mr. Bruner, he could give me some pointers. At least I could apologise for the big F that the big fat F that I was about to score in this exam. I didn't want to leave Yancey Academy, but with it, with him thinking I hadn't tried. I walked downstairs to the Felicity offices. Most of them were dark and empty, but Mr. Bruner's door was just ajar, light from his window stretching across the half hallway floor. I was three steps from the door handle when I heard voices inside the office. Mr. Bruner asked a question. A voice that was definitely Grover's said, Worried about Percy, sir? I froze. I'm not usually an eavesdropper, but I dare you to try not listening to your, hear your best friend talking about you to an adult. I inched closer. Alone this summer, Grover was saying. I mean, a kindly one in this school. Now that we know for sure, and they know too, we would, it, we would only make matters worse by rushing him, Mr. Bruner said. We need the boy to make more, but he may not have time. The summer still is his deadline. We'll have to resolve resolve without him grover let him enjoy his ignorance while he still can sir we saw her his imagination mr bruner said the mist over the students and staff will be enough to convince him that sir i i can't fail in my duties again grover's voice was choked with emotion you know what that would mean you haven't failed grover mr bruner said kindly i should have seen her for what she was now let's just worry about keeping percy alive until next autumn Ooh. The mythology book dropped out of my hand and hit the floor with a thud. Mr. Bruner went silent. My heart hammering, I picked up the book and backed down the hall. A shadow slid across the lighted glass of Mr. Bruner's office door. The shadow of something much taller than my wheelchair-bounded teacher, holding something that looks specifically like an archer's bow. I opened the nearest door and slipped inside. A few seconds later, I heard a slow clop, 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 like muffled wood blocks. Um... Muffled wood blocks, then a sound like an animal snuffing right outside my door. A large dark shape paused in front of the glass and moved on. A bead of sweat trickled down my neck. Somewhere in the hallway, Mr. Bruner spoke. Nothing, he murmured. My nerves haven't been right since the win winter solicitor. Mine neither, Grover said, but I could have sworn. Go back to the door, Mr. Bruner told you. You've got a long day of exams tomorrow. Don't remind me. The lights went out in Mr. Bruner's office. I waited in the dark for what seemed like forever. Finally, I slipped out into the hallway and made my way back up to the door. Grover was lying on his bed studying his Latin exam notes like he'd been there all night. Hey, he said, barely eyes. You going to be ready for the test? I didn't answer. You look awful, he frowned. Is everything okay? Just tired. I turned so he could, couldn't could read my expression and started getting ready for bed. I didn't understand what I'd heard downstairs. I wanted... To believe I'd imagine the whole thing. But one thing that was clear, Grover and Mr. Bruno were talking about me behind my back. They thought I was in some kind of danger. The next afternoon, I was leaving the, the three-hour Latin exam, my eyes swimming with all the Greek and Roman names I'd misspelled. Mr. Bruno came, called me back inside. For a moment, I was worried he'd found out I, my, about my eavesdropping the night before, but that didn't seem to be the problem. Percy, he said, don't be discouraged about leaving Yancey. It's, it's for the best. His tone was, a kind, was kind, but the words still embarrassed me. Even though he was squeaking quietly, the other kids finished the test couldn't hear. Couldn't hear. Nancy Bobovitz smirked at me and made sarcastic kissing motions with her lips. I mumbled, okay, sir. 
I mean, Mr. Bruno wheeled his chair back and forth like he wasn't sure what to say. This isn't the right place for you. It was only a matter of time. My eyes stung. He was my favourite teacher in front of the class telling me I couldn't handle it. After saying he believed in me all year, now he was telling me that I am destined to get kicked out. Right, I said trembling. No, no, Mr. Bruno said. Oh, oh, confound it all. What I'm trying to say, you're not normal, Percy. That's some, that's nothing to be. Thanks, I blurted. Thanks a lot, sir, for reminding me. Percy, but I was already gone. On the last day of term, I shoved my clothes into my suitcase. The other guys were joking around talking about their vacation plans. One of them was going on a hiking trip to Switzerland. Another was cruising the Caribbean for a month. They were juvenile... They were juvenile delinquents like me, but they were rich juvenile delinquents. Their daddies were exclusives or ambassadors or celebrities. I was nobody from a family of nobodies. They asked me what I'd be doing this summer, and I told them I was going back to the city. What I didn't tell them was that I'd have to get a summer job, walking dogs or selling magazine subscriptions, and spend my free time worrying about where I'd go in the school, go to school in the autumn. Oh, one of the guys said, that's cool. They went back to their conversation as if I'd never existed. The only person I dreaded saying goodbye to was Grover, but as it turned out, I didn't have to. He'd booked a ticket to Manhattan on the same Greyhound as I had, so that we were going to be together again, heading into the city. During the whole bus ride, Grover kept glancing nervously down the aisle, watching the other passengers. It occurred to me that he'd always acted nervous or fidgety when he left Yancey as if he'd expected something bad to happen. Before, I'd always assumed he was just worried about getting teased, but there was nobody to tease him on the Greyhound. Finally, I couldn't stand that, stand in it anymore. I said, looking for kindly ones. Grover nearly jumped out of his seat. What? What do you mean? I confessed about eavesdropping on him and Mr. Bruno the night before the exam. Grover's eye twitched. How much did you hear? Oh, not much. What's the summer solicitor's deadline? He winced. Look, look, Percy, I was just worried for you, see? I mean, hallucinating about the demon maths teachers, Grover. And I was telling Mr. Bruno that maybe you were overstressed or something, because there was no such person as Miss Dodds and... Grover, you're a really, really bad liar. His ears turned pink. From his shirt pocket, he fished a grubby business card. Just take this, OK, in case you need me this summer. The card was in a fancy script, which I which was murder on my dyslexic eyes. But I finally made out something like Grover Underwood Keeper, Half Blood Hill, Long Island, New York. What's half? Don't say it out loud, he yelped. That's my um summer address. My heart sank. Grover had a summer home. I'd never considered yet that his family might be as rich as the others in Yancey. Okay, I said glumly. So, like, if I want to come visit your mansion, he nodded, or if you need me. Why would I need you? It came out harsher than I meant to. Grover blushed right down it to his Adam's apple. Look, Percy, the truth is, I I kind of have to protect you. I stared at him. All year long, I'd, for, I'd gotten in fights keeping bullies away from him. I'd lost sleep worrying that he'd get beaten up next year without me. And here he was acting like he was the one defending me. Grover, I said, what exactly are you protecting me from? There was a huge grinding noise under our feet. Black smoke poured from the dashboard and the whole bus filled with the smell like rotten eggs. The driver cursed and limped the greyhound over to the side of the highway. After a few minutes clanking around the engine compartment, the driver announced that he would have to get off. Grover and I filled outside with everyone else. We were on a stretch country road. No place you'd notice if you went down if you didn't break down there. On our side of the highway was nothing but maple trees and litter from passing cars. On the other side, across four lanes of asphalt, shimmering with afternoon heat, was an old-fashioned fruit stand. The stuff on sale looked really good. Heap-in boxes of blood-red cherries and apples, walnuts and apricots, jugs of cider and clawfoot tub full of ice. There were no customers, just three old ladies sitting in rocking chairs, the shade of a maple tree knitting the be biggest pair of socks I'd ever seen. I mean, these socks were the size of sweaters, and they were clearly socks. The lady on the right had knitted them. 
The lady on the left missed the other. The lady in the middle had an enormous basket of electric blue yarn. All three women looked ancient, with pale white faces like fruit leather. Silver hair tied back in white bandanas. Bony arms sticking out of their bleached cotton dresses. And the weirdest thing was, they seemed to be looking right at me. I looked over at Grover to say something about this, and saw the blood had drained from his face. His nose was twitching. Grover, I said, hey man, tell me they're not looking at you. They are, aren't they? Yeah, weird, huh? You think those socks would fit me? Not funny, Percy, not funny at all. The old lady in the middle took out a huge pair of scissors, gold and silver, long bladed like shears. I heard Grover catch his breath. We're getting on the bus, he told me. Come on. What, I said? It's a thousand degrees out here. Come on. He prized, it. He prized open the door and ran inside, but I stayed back. Across the road, the old ladies were still watching me in the middle of one, cut the yarn. I swear I could hear that sniff across the four lanes of traffic. Her two friends balled up the electric blue socks having me wondered who they could possibly be for. Squad Shack or Godzilla? At the, at the rear of the bus, the driver wrenched a big chunk of smoking metal out of the engine compartment. The bus shuddered and the engine roared back to life. The passengers cheered. Darn right, yelled yeah, the driver. He slapped the bus with a hit attacked. Everyone back on board. We, once we got going, I started feeling feverish as if I would caught the flu. Grover didn't look much better. He was shivering and his teeth were chattering. Grover? Yeah, what are you not telling me? He dabbed his forehead with his shirt sleeve. Percy, what did you see back at the fruit stand? You mean the old ladies? What about them, man? They're not like Miss Dobbs, are they? His expression was hard to read, but I got the feeling that the fruit stand ladies were something much, much worse than Miss Dobbs. He said, just tell me what you saw. The middle one took her scissors and she cut the yarn. He closed his eyes and made gestures with his fingers that might have been crossing himself, but it wasn't. It was something else, something almost older. He said he saw her snip the cord. Yes, yeah, so. But even if, even as I said it, he knew it was a big deal. This is not happening, Grover mumbled. He started chewing his thumb. I don't want this to be like the last time. What last time? Always sixth grade. They never get past sixth. Grover, I said, because he was really starting to scare me. What the hell are you talking about? Let me walk you home from the bus station. Promise me. This seemed like a strange request to me, but I promised he could. Is this like a superstition or something? I asked. No answer. Grover, the sniffing of the yarn, does that mean somebody's going to die? He looked at me normally. Then he was already picking up the flowers, oh, like like it'd be my best coffin. That is that chapter done. I feel really sick because I just read a massive book. Oh, well, chapter of a book. Next is chapter three. So, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.